Subscribe now. Happy 2023, everyone. Woo-hoo, this is probably year. our uh, officially our second uh, episode in 2023 because we uh, had, did, had Andy McGrath on the first one that aired. Uh, but Happy New Year, everyone. We're super duper excited to be here. Just happy uh, to look forward to 2023. You guys are amazing. Just been some really cool things uh, going on. And uh, I'm so appreciative of um, recently. Um, of me? Of course, I'm appreciative of you always. <laughs> every, every single day. Oh. Every single day. Oh, my God, guys. Look what Tim got us for oh Christmas. Oh, my gosh. Turn it the other way. So so you so, guys got to hear the story. Can I tell the story? Sure. Okay, so Tim wanted, because we always drink Surprise. tea. Surprise. We're drinking tea. It really is tea. It's not tea toes, but it's tea. <laughs> and but we drink tea always during our podcast. So Tim got us little Bigfoot influencers podcast mugs, but he put the emblem like there. So like if I'm drinking my tea, you can't see. So I have to like drink my tea like this. So basically, for those of you who are listening, he put like the logo in the wrong place. So when I'm drinking my tea, you're not actually going to be able to see it. So if you see me drinking my tea in a really weird way, it's because of that. But it was really thoughtful. So, yeah. So the lesson here it's the is thought that counts. I should have <laughs> consulted her first. I thought I was doing something really cool. And I did. It's still cool. But I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I screwed that up. It's super cool. We'll order more if we have to. I'm so. just going to turn it like this. Yeah. So when I'm drinking, I can like. So. That's totally yeah. baby, but go ahead. Yeah. But anyway, happy 2023. Right. We're happy to have our guest tonight. It's so cool. Ooh, I'm so yeah. excited. So, Kenny well, Brown. Kenny, from the, Dr. Kenny Brown. From the Brown family. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. They're, they might be as at, at least the only family that I know that the whole family, they're all Bigfooters. It's amazing. And they're it's, the coolest family they ever. Are, yeah. Big family. Because they have four boys, right? I don't think three, but Kenny will correct us when okay, he gets on here. Okay, because we have four boys. So, yeah, poor so. Teresa Brown. <laughs> we know. Yeah, we do. Girl, girl, we know what you went through, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, yeah, I can't wait to get Kenny in here. Um, yeah. But, yeah, there's just a ton going on. So, I just want to say thank you. Uh, recently, um, Steve Coles and Chris Bennett um, had their best and worst of 2022 episode on their Squatch uh, D Detect or Squatch D TV uh, podcast and YouTube, and they were kind enough to recognize uh, the Bigfoot influencers as the book of the year. So, gentlemen, Woo-hoo! you guys are amazing. So Thank proud you so of much. my baby. Well, it's not so about proud. me. It really is. It's it's no, about it is them. about yeah, you. So it's, it's about you bringing them out into the world yeah, because. So. If it weren't for you, there would not be a book where everybody could uh, have a reference to who's who in the Bigfoot world. And then obviously there's going to be another volume. So because there's just way too many people uh, to interview Mm -hmm. uh, in the Bigfoot world. And so I got to get going on that soon. So really soon. So um, we've got some really cool episodes coming up. So what's coming up next? So we have Daryl Collier from the NAWAC which is the North American Wood Ape Conservancy. Conservancy. Good job, Conservancy. girl. Yay. <laughs> so, he, you know, Tim is just like, oh, my God, because Tim obviously, you know, interviewed him for the book. So he's, you know, even though I've read his chapter, Tim's just like, you're just going to be completely blown away by this guy. So we're super excited about having him. By Daryl and what they all do down there. But anyway, go ahead. I'm yeah. And we're also going to do a live Q&A. Um, with Dr. Esteban Sarmiento. So we're going to be able to do, we're going to be doing a live show where you can um, comment and ask questions from a primatologist um, who is, who says he's on the fence. But I think I he's think a you big I think believer. you got him, Esteban. <laughs> if you're listening, you know that's okay. Yeah, we'll get a, get a kick out of it. But tonight we're having Dr. Kenny Brown, so we're yeah. super excited to have him. So Tim, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody about Kenny? Sure. I mean, so Kenny Brown is uh, he's from Southern Ohio. He's with the BFRO. Uh, so we're going to get into that uh, again. As I mentioned, his whole family is they're amazing people, and his and he's we're going to ask him that story of, of how you know, about the whole family. Mm -hmm. He is a, he's Dr. Kenny Brown. So he's, he's doing his residency now. And I think he's going to be a, um, a, a physician, family physician, primary care physician, primary care physician. Mm -hmm. 
and he'll probably correct me if I made that made a mistake there. But he's been in the woods. He's got. I mean, he's he's grown up in the woods, hunting, he, you know, hunt. fishing. We've been out in the woods with him. They taught us so much about Avid just birder. just all yep. kinds of things. So, yep. which is important. We're gonna we're gonna talk about why that's important too. When if you're out there looking for that uh, hairy, uh, elusive creature that we're all interested in. So. And he's committed a lot of his time out in the woods um, in Ohio, um, you know, learning about Ohio's wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can remember my, I, I was with uh, Kenny's younger brother who uh, we were out hiking um, in Ohio and was, you know, teaching us about mushroom mm -hmm. picking and we found some chanterelles in August, and that was kind of fun. So the whole family is just really up on what's going on with the flora and fauna and trees um, mm -hmm. in their area. Um, so it's a super cool uh, experience to go hiking with them. And we were really lucky to do that a couple of years ago. We were. And, and Kenny does. He gets into um, wildlife audio. And by understanding wildlife audio, obviously, he's got some interesting things that he's captured on audio as well. And so let's, let's bring him in. Yay. So we're going to bring Kenny in. Let's cool. make sure I do this right. I think we're good. Hey, Kenny. Kenny. Hey guys. How are you? It's good to see you. Doing great. Yes. Likewise. Um, you guys have a fantastic podcast. I've listened to really the majority oh, of episodes. So good. Um, we and love I it. We just love getting to know you guys. Sure. I always learn something new whenever you guys have a podcast and um, the guests are all amazing. And, Tim, congrats on the book, The Bigfoot Influencers. Um, I read it page to page, and it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Humbled by that. Definitely yeah. am. Um, and we, yeah, we're just excited to have you here. So, so do we remember when we first met, Kenny? Yeah, oh. I, um, I was going to bring that up. Gosh, it was Yeah, when was it? Was it 2020? No, it was earlier than that. Oh, I wait. think it was, it might have been, it was either 2019 or 2020. Because you were a speaker, weren't you? Yes, in 2020 at the Ohio. And that's what I remember. No, we met Kenny before then, though. Oh, in 2019. Right. I think it was 19. Yeah, yeah maybe right. 19. Um, right. Briefly met before, but I think 2020 was when um, you guys met the whole family. And then uh, the there was a hike after the conference. And you guys, I, I think that was the date when uh, we all got to go on the hike together. And who's your little brother? Little brother is Jack. Yep. Jack. Jack. Oh my God. He's such a cool dude. And, <laughs> yeah. Love him. We have four boys. Like you guys, are there There's four three, of you? Right? Three total. Three total. Yep. Three of you. Okay. I couldn't remember. Because we met his older brother last year for the first time. Right. Right. Yep. That's what it is. And um, yep. gosh, that seems like just the other day. Time flies. Yep. It sure does. Yeah. The, but the family that Bigfoot's together stays together. So. Yeah. <laughs> And so you guys are definitely the Bigfoot family for sure. <laughs> thank you. Thank and I got you. adopted into the family last year by <laughs> Renee Holland from you know we we all know who finding Renee. Bigfoot. Yeah, so right. She so she's I'm now part of the Brown family. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's spot on. <laughs> but so yeah, so so Kenny, I guess you know let's start with because uh, we most people who are listening probably know who you are. But we, there might be some people who don't know who you are. So can you take right. take us back to, um, I guess, how you got interested in the subject of Bigfoot? Yeah. So how did you get interested in the subject of Bigfoot? Because I know your whole family is interested in it. Was it from your family? Um, gosh, I mean, we've talked about it since. So I guess let's start with, um, like you guys mentioned, I grew up in the woods my whole entire life. Um, I grew up just north of Columbus uh, in Westerville, Ohio. But um, my mom's side of the family owns a lot of acreage in Vinton County um, and about 200 acres. So all the time we were going down there to hunt, to fish, to spend time in local forests around the area. And then, of course, my mom's side of the family was there. So to visit with them, um, I remember at a young age, um, it was at a family gathering. We did a little hunting trip. And after the hunting trip, before then, uh, my mom, dad, and I, and my brothers had always watched like some of the Bigfoot shows that were on. And this is before Finding Bigfoot, obviously, but some of the Bigfoot shows, some of the old Bigfoot movies, um, they were always great, but we never really talked about the possibility of Bigfoot in Ohio. So on that specific hunting trip afterwards, I just mentioned it to my dad and I was like, hey dad, do you think that you know, Bigfoot could potentially be in Ohio? And he's like, yeah, I mean, I think anything's possible. You know, we're always uh, finding out something new in the woods every day. So. Ever since then, you know, it's always been in the back of my mind, but I would say. How old were you, Kenny? When Probably seven or eight years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very young age. Um, 
So was forward. Jack was Jack annoying when he when you were seven or eight and he was a little pipsqueak? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, he Jack, may be watching. Yeah. So. <laughs> is Jack the, Jack's the youngest, right? Jack's the youngest, and then Michael is um, my older brother. We're, we're all three years apart, and then my parents. Their names are Mike and Teresa. So we're the Brown right. family. Yeah. Yeah, we've all had a strong interest in this from, like I said, just from all of us being young. Um, fast forward a little bit. I, so I went to school around the Columbus, the Western Bull area, um, went to undergrad at Ohio Dominican University and um, got my major in exercise science. And I'd always wanted to uh, go into the field of medicine because my mom has been a nurse for a long time. I mean, that's been her main occupation. So she's always had um, a really good influence on me. And I originally wanted to, be, wanted to become a physician assistant, but I figured why not use that time and just um, use it to go to medical school um, and become a doctor so I can better help my patients that way. Yeah. And I have to say, like, your mom is such a cool person. Like if I was if I ever had to pick one person to take care of me in a hospital, it would definitely be your mom. Oh, that's very she, sweet. You know, like, no, she's just got the heart mm -hmm. for that. She's got the heart of being a nurse. Mm -hmm. And there's not I mean, I think a lot of nurses get jaded and burnt out and some nurses are just not meant for nursing, but your mom is like, you can tell she's totally, uh, she has her heart in it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. she's really a saint. Um, she's been she wonderful. Is. And as time moved forward, I think what really pushed us to um, start really looking into the subject was the release of Finding Bigfoot. I mean, that had a uh, really big influence and impact on a lot of people. Um, I'm sure maybe you guys as well. And that's really what encouraged us, you know, after several years of watching the show, we started it ever since the first, the first episode came out and we never missed a beat since then. Um, probably a couple of years into that is when we actually, um, you know, made the pursuit to actually get serious and start doing our own research with the subject. So was it all of you just made a decision? Um, I would say pretty much. Yeah. Um, other than my, older brother, you know, he had a lot of stuff going on at the time with, you know, starting a new family and things like that, but he had always watched the show as well. And, um, it was just for the sake of, you know, me and my younger brother having more time with my parents, um, to kind of pursue the subject more, but my, my, um, older brother is definitely, uh, into it now and a lot more open to pursuing the subject. So, I mean, I think you guys, I mean, I have to say this, uh, just from hanging around with you all. I mean, you've really taken the time to understand um, the flora and the environment um, of your area. Why would you say that is so important, um, particularly in regards to uh, the subject of Bigfoot and researching? Mm -hmm. So without even, I guess, first, um, without even talking about the subject of Bigfoot, um, like I said, we've been in the woods our entire life. So just knowing about the normal flora and fauna of our local forests, um, especially in Southern Ohio, where our property was, um, we always, always had an interest in, you know, learning about dendrology, the study of trees, knowing which tree is which, because um, if you really learn the trees, you can get really good at uh, morale mushroom hunting and looking for other different mushrooms, as we talked about some of, some of that with you on the prior hike that we did, mm -hmm. um, learning about the plants, um, what's edible, what's not edible, um, and just a local wildlife. And <clears throat> in particular for me, I would always had a strong passion for um, wanting to learn about what animal sound or bird sound was making the sound that I was hearing in the forest. Um, it would always stick in the back of my head. And then growing up, there was always multiple instances where I would hear a sound. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've heard that before, but I've never been able to actually know what it is, you know, other than going online and doing just a blank search of bird sounds or animal sounds in Ohio. Um, always had a strong passion for just knowing what common wildlife um, and uncommon wildlife uh, noises are in Ohio. Yeah. And sound is so important, you know, because, uh, you know, everybody wants the visual of an animal, a bird or whatever, right. but uh, sound is evidence of something that's out there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I'm really into sounds too, um, of birds, uh, even like, remember the owl that we mm -hmm. had that experience with in our woods here, you know, there is a, um, a barred owl, mm -hmm. you know, the one sure. that goes, hoo, 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 mm -hmm. hoo, hoo. Yeah. so we were hiking back there and I heard him and I made that noise back at him and he, this owl came okay. flying over towards us, just like Checking landed on yeah. a branch right yeah. in front of us. I'm like, oh my God, like this, yeah, it was pretty <laughs> crazy. 
But yeah. yeah, it's it's proof that it's not just a visual of an animal. It's it's I mean, sound is so important as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you've been really into that. I mean, obviously, if you're interested in your other wildlife audio, whether it be a bird or a fox or um, I don't even know if deer make that much sounds, but I'm sure they do. Foxes, you know. So let's talk about maybe some of your Bigfoot audio that mm -hmm. you've experienced. Yeah, yeah. Um, as time went on and I had more time, you know, from studying medicine, uh, obviously medical school is very involved, takes up a ton of time. So that's really your job, even before your job <laughs> of being a doctor, right. is just studying, 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 and getting clinical experience. So it takes up a lot of time. So I can tell you um, how big of uh, a hobby just being in the woods is, has been for me. Cause uh, I mean, outside of school, outside of, you know, being in the field of medicine, that's really my number one hobby. Um, but it was specifically 2019 um, when I really started to look into the subject and start doing my own research. Um, and I thought for a long time at that point, up until that point when I made the, uh, the decision, I felt the subject needed to advance somehow because it was at a stalemate. We weren't getting much evidence, um, whether in the form of footprint cast or audio recordings or um, videos or pictures in general. Um, and already with my strong interest in the outdoors and wanting to know what each sound was in the woods, um, I figured the best way I could help subject forward was um, to start doing continuous nighttime recording. As you guys may have heard the term um, LDR, which is long duration mm -hmm. recording. Um, and, you know, my mom, dad, my brothers all had the same thoughts. Um, they've had a strong interest in, you know, knowing local wildlife sounds and vocalizations too. Um, so we all do the recording together, which I, we'll definitely um, delve into. But I wasn't yet in the BFR. RO in 2019. Um, it was about February, March. And um, after already have listening to pretty much every possible Bigfoot or Sasquatch recording um, available online for several years prior and hearing about people who are already knowledgeable with the, um, audio recording in general, I had an idea kind of of who to contact. Um, I reached out to people like Charles Kimbrough, Charlie Page, um, Mononka Hela, um, even David Ellis, who you guys recently had on. It was a great episode. Um, and the combination of those people just gave me general information of how to get started with audio recording, um, specifically at nighttime. Um, and it was early March of 2019 when the first um, long duration recorder was actually hung. And it was actually, we built three of, of them at that time. And then uh, as soon as we, as soon as we knew it, three turned into about 10 to 12, which it is um, as of now, that's how many we manage at any one point in time. Is it, is it on your, per, where it, you know, you don't have to d d divulge exactly mm -hmm. where it is, but it's on your personal property or did you have, do you have them all in a specific location or how do you, how do you approach that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so w we mainly cover the Southern half of the state um, and it's not specifically on our property. Um, most of our recorders are pretty much in, I mean, in a large area, over 100 square miles, I would say. Um, but they're covered across that area. And then, you know, I might have one or two, um, hanging at investigation um, or a report that we may have gotten in. Like I know my brother hung one the other day for a report that we got in just in an area. So the bulk of them are in one area. Um, that's kind of what we figured would be the best way to gather data rather than having them spread all throughout the state, um, having them in one certain area, but in um, specific areas in the large area to try to cover as much ground as we can to um, potentially just learn about wildlife um, audio sounds in general. Even if you know we didn't get some unknown sounds that could potentially be attributed to Bigfoot, um, just learning about that in general is awesome. It's always fun. So, are, are you setting up uh, just audio, or are you also setting up um, game game cameras as well? So, I've always just in general, even before doing the audio, just put um, game cams up just to monitor deer, um, try to find where the big bucks are at. Um, so that's never really, I guess, directly been associated with our audio recording. It's definitely been on my mind to do it at some point, but just when um, I got to find the time to do that because audio recording takes up a lot of time. Um, but yeah, never, just specifically right now, mainly audio recording is what we do. So do you think it's easier? Okay, so first of all, let's talk, let's like, you know, let's talk about the first time that you got an audio recording of a suspected Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe you could like explain to everybody what that was like. And is that the audio I have? One of the audios I have? 
That is not one of the audios okay. that um, I specifically sent you. It is on my SoundCloud for people to listen to um, if they would like. But the first time, so whether you hang up, whether you're managing game cameras, um, audio recorders, you want to look for a good spot where whatever you're monitoring, let's say deer, you want a spot that has plenty of cover, um, large forest, water available in multiple locations um, to where it's not too far for them to travel to get water. Um, and in general, those are spots that you want to look for to potentially hang a game camera or um, hang up a recorder in a tree, things like that. Um, I started, like I said, uh, early March in 2019 with recording. And um, honestly, it, I picked a great spot. It had a history of uh, Bigfoot activity and like prior reports and things like that. Um, within the first two to three weeks that I hung up um, my recorder, I got an unknown sound that I was already, you know, decently familiar with wildlife sounds at the, at the time, but um, but I got an, an unknown sound and multiple unknown sounds that actually went for about five five or six days, and I had no idea. And I was like, oh my gosh, this, you know, I hear a knock here, a knock there, I hear whoops, I hear howling, and I was like, is someone just messing with me? Right. So my family said the same thing. We're like, okay, we must have got either really lucky or someone's messing with us, you know, to get a sound that soon. So based off the prior people I'd contacted, I'd sent some of the audio off um, and really nobody was able to come up with what it could be. Um, so do you, I mean, like when you say, is somebody messing with us? Mm -hmm. I mean, did, I mean, were, did anybody, how many people knew uh, where you put the audio recorders? Just us, us five, my mom, dad, uh, and my two brothers. And then me. Um, and they wouldn't five. do that. No, they would never do that. Right. No, no. Okay. They're very, very close knit family, specifically yeah. when, the only people that knew where the recorders were when we hung the first three was only my dad and I, because um, we were the ones to hang them. Um, nobody else can make it that day. So nobody else knew exactly where they were other than my dad and I. And um, when I'd heard some of the things that we captured, I was like, oh my gosh. Um, it's also a really important aspect to note that any unknown sound can never 100, you can never 100% say it's a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch um, because we don't have any video. Uh, right. Uh, big footed Sasquatch yeah, if you saw it making a sound, first. then that would be different. Yeah. Yeah, but right. even still, even even a video is not a hundred percent. Exactly. You know, exactly. so all the evidence that we have, whether it be visual or audio or you know, mm -hmm. smelling or whatever, so it's yeah. not a hundred percent. And that's, what else? What else would make an? I mean, so in in our environment, whether it's uh, made by an animal or anything else, what else? Could, where else could a knock come from? I mean, what else could make a knock sound? Sure. Yep. Um, for the audience, uh, what knock means is a wood knock. Um, they're these popping, loud uh, sounds that sound like a wood being like a piece of wood being stricken on a tree, um, and then producing what they call or termed a wood knock. Um, any single wooden knock you hear, which means just one single wooden knock, um, that can be caused potentially by a number of things just in uh, uh, any forest, really, especially during wintertime. In wintertime, um, obviously, trees have sap in them. And when it's really, really cold out, there can be a lot of pressure changes inside um, the tree internally. Sap can move in uh, different positions that can actually cause internal popping of the tree where the bark pretty much just, just goes... And the tree on the outside won't move or anything, but they produce really loud pops. Um, I remember hearing it. Uh, I've heard it uh, n numerous times before, um, but one time I, uh, when it was, it was like five years ago, it was below zero and the trees were popping like every five minutes. So I always tell people, always be weary about single knocks unless you have a how, a whoop, some other um, actual vocalization that happens in the vicinity of the knock or before or after the knock. That starts to get more interesting but i always tell people with single knocks always be weary um you know they are really interesting you can get really loud knocks at night that usually aren't caused by anything like single knocks um but the real interest starts to come when you get double knocks or triple knocks because that's a lot less likely to be something natural happening in the forest compared to just one knock does that make sense yeah yes. definitely what well, thanks for yeah. explaining that yeah that was so, awesome yeah. i don't think i've ever heard that before yeah. so yeah. that was super cool yeah yep um we did a lot of thinking, you know, around the time when we started recording. Um, and we ultimately came up with the conclusion of what better way to try and discover um, an unknown animal, animal than to try and record it in its natural state. Um, and when I say natural state, I mean um, having a, you know, a quiet re recorder hanging in the woods um, to not cha change an animal's natural behavior, 
rather than you know someone going out in the woods, knocking on a tree, doing a howl, that would influence an animal's natural behavior. So what better way to do that than to have a recorder hanging up um, in the middle of the night? I was already in the woods all the time when, you know, uh, pretty much my whole life. And I figured by having um, an LDR record in the woods every night, it's really like having another set of ears um, in the forest without having to be there, which I felt was the best and quickest way to get to gather um, data, really. But, so finding footprints or impressions in the ground is pretty difficult in Appalachia uh, based on, you know, the components of the soil here, the dirt. It's just not conducive to um, finding or to forming many footprints in the ground. Um, I think footprints are some of the best, if not the best evidence of Sasquatches, in my opinion. But it's such a rarity to find here that I felt I could do my due diligence with um, following what my personal interest was by collecting audio data. Um, and I feel like that can be gathered a lot quicker than finding footprints, which has definitely been proven to be true after almost four years of recording. now. So I, you know, we've heard that, um, you know, there's a theory that Sasquatches, for whatever reason, will avoid trail cams because there's it emits a, a type of signal that maybe they could pick up. Um, is that similar also with an audio? So that's a great situation? question. That's something. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, mm -hmm. I think about that a lot, and mm -hmm. I don't think they produce as much sound. I don't know that this is just a guess. Um, I haven't done any mm -hmm. experiments or actually had the time to look into it much. Um, I don't think they produce as much sound as, um, you know, your average game camera that is hung up in the woods. Um, mm -hmm. They're smaller units. They don't take as much to run. Um, I feel like there's a lot more technology involved with um, game cameras. You know, we've had audio recorders for, for many, many, many years. Um, and so we have game cameras as well, but audio recorders, the technology on that has increased a lot more um, in prior years compared to recently with um, game cameras now. So I don't think they make as much audible noise. Um, little kids, you know, babies, um, little children can hear uh, the average game cameras um, because mm -hmm. they don't have the um, presbycusis, which is uh, a medical term called um, pretty much hearing loss. And it's natural hearing loss as we age. That's the term presbycusis. So what? My joke. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I just smacked him in case you heard that. that no, no, smack. I didn't. <laughs> um, so, but, you know what? That's interesting. So, because, yeah. and also, I think like an audio recorder would be a lot further away from a Sasquatch howling. So, right. if it did emit any kind of frequency or any kind of sound, they it wouldn't be. be able to hear it necessarily or feel like it was a threat because. To get something on video on a trail cam, it would have to be pretty close. Yeah, yeah, the odds are much, uh, much more in your favor for collecting data with audio because they. Uh, it's all about the range of you know where you can collect evidence. I'd say if you have the right microphones um, in your LDR unit, you can probably get if it was a loud howl, probably within a mile to a mile mile and a half wow. away. So that's a lot of ground. So when you place audio recorders, you try to you know go roughly a mile and a half from each other to cover a very large area, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it you must have been sense. completely blown away with those first howls and audio that you were getting. I mean, that's pretty crazy. Right, right. Um, and that I had something here. I have some notes written of something I wanted to bring up. Um, so when we got those first sets of how sets of vocalizations for like the first five or six days. Um, at the time, I had LDRs that only recorded for two weeks at a time, so I had to change them every two weeks. It was very involved. Now it's every two months. It's a lot more doable. Um, but every two weeks, I would go to the recorder, bring it back home, go through each night. But I would start with the most recent night rather than the first night of the whole audio recording session. And I'd found when I grabbed it, um, you know, several days prior that all of this was going on. So I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, there might be a good chance that whatever is making these sounds is still here. So that upcoming weekend, um, my dad and my two brothers actually went out um into that spot and um got there about 10 p.m and really just stayed quiet all night and did some nighttime hiking and split up into two teams and within the first hour um there was a section where our trails branched off from each other so um two people going this way two people going this way and there was a, a good bit of forest in between both trails and about an hour into the night um i was walking down the trail and from the patch of forest between our trails um I was walking down a hill and I had a rock land two to three feet. Um, you know, it was in the dark, but I shined on my flashlight real, real fast and I could see a rock rolling down the hill that landed two to three feet away from me. And I, 
as soon as my brain processed that I was actually looking at a rock rolling down the hill, um, I froze and the hair stuck up on the back of my neck. And I instantly felt I knew exactly where the rock came from. And I had a, a FLIR Scout TK at the time. It was the, I think those are like the $500 ones. Um, they can only see a man from about 100 yards. So they're pretty grainy, but I was so frozen that I couldn't even, I had it on. I couldn't even look back just to see if I was. How, so how big was, was the rock? Um, it was probably the size of like between the size of a baseball to a grapefruit. Yeah. So that eliminates a lot of things, right? I mean, yep. and so. we had, we had lost um, radio contact um, with the other two people, with my dad and brother. So um, we didn't know at the same time that they heard about 20 minutes of what sounded like rock clacking the whole from that middle part of forest between both trails. So we ended up being out to like 6 a.m. that night, and there started to be a lot of really good audio that we captured. Um, so that's a major thing that we, you know, try to look for with these recordings is, you know, can we be, can we predict an area where they're going to be in and try to get more data or evidence to, you know, open people, more people's eyes to the subject. So, so east of the Mississippi, why do you think Ohio is such a hot spot for um, Bigfoot activity? Mm -hmm. Um. Ohio in general, it's a fantastic state. It has tons of water, lots of forest cover, um, and especially towards the southern half of the state. Um, that's, you know, the Appalachian part of the state, the unglaciated area that produced a lot of rolling hills um, that just go for miles and miles. Um, some giant hills, but I wouldn't say mountains like West Virginia, um, but some very steep terrain. And these types of forests um, really all over the state are loaded with um, trees and foliage that provide an abundance of food for really all types of wildlife, all sizes of animals. Um, Ohio in general already has plenty of water throughout the entire state, as you guys may know, um, which is likely why it's one of the top states in the nation for big uh, reports coming into the BFRO. And the deer are just plentiful here. I mean, everywhere you look, anywhere in the state, there's just tons of white-tailed deer. So would you say that, um, like that Ohio, especially the southern portion, is almost like a little mini kind of rainforest? You know, is there a lot of rainfall? I'd say there's about an average amount of rainfall that we get compared to a lot of the Midwestern states, um, Indiana, um, one of our neighboring states, Pennsylvania, they probably have a little more rainfall than us, but I wouldn't classify it as a rainforest um, just based off some of the flora that grow here. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't rain all the time, um, but there are an abundance, you know, especially in the areas with the rolling hills, um, you know, there's streams pretty much at the bottom of each ravine. Um, and then, yeah, there's tons of streams, tons of rivers, um, if you go up north, uh, you know, you run into the Great Lakes um, and in between all that areas, there's multiple lakes, tons of ponds really just scattered throughout the whole entire state. So finding water so, is not a problem for any animal. So there's food, water and cover. Right. Exactly. Areas where they can. And terrain. Yeah. How about yeah. caves? I mean, uh, are there I mean, is that is that a theory, too, that uh, that it's possible that animals, including a Bigfoot, could be utilizing caves? And are there mm -hmm. there's caves in Ohio, correct? Yeah, there's some caves in Ohio, um, not as many as uh, other states that are really known for it. Um, there's lots and lots of rock um, like overhangs. Um, and that brings up a good point. There's a lot of mines, too. There's abandoned mines. A lot of them are open, um, especially when you get into some of the some of the deep hollows in the state. Um, a lot of so southern Ohio was known for its mining. Um, and I've came across several mines that, you know, I can see into. They're not covered. A lot of them are covered. Um, but that's, you know, I think if if anything, the times that they would go, you know, into an overhang or a cave, wouldn't be to look for really food or water. I think it'd really be to hide um, just for a short duration of time. Um, I think to, you know, to take cover from bad weather that's coming in. Um, a lot of times cave, you know, stay the same temperature. So it, if it's really cold out, you know, you have a good chance of staying relatively warm um, for many types of animals in a cave. Yeah, because it can get, it can mm. get cold in Ohio yeah. for yeah. sure. Especially recently, with all, a lot of the nation, right? Yeah. Right. Except now it's warm. It's crazy, but, right? <laughs> so, Sixty degrees. Uh, <laughs> before we get into, because I want to, I want to, we're going to share some audio with the with the the listeners and the viewers, which is is really exciting. What's mm -hmm. the what's the weirdest or most compelling thing that's happening, you guys, while you've been out in the woods? Mm -hmm. That so, could be related to this or anything, really. Yep. Yeah. So, uh. I always tell people I'm 99.9% .9 confident that um, I, I know that Bigfoots and Sasquatches are real. Um, I never say any, anything is 100% because, you know, sometimes you say that and it's not. But I, 
I never give anything 100%. I'm 99.9% um, percent in line with um, Sasquatch as being real, not only based off of the data we've collected from audio, but from my own experiences. And really our main, we've had the number of experiences, you know, a handful, probably four or five with them over many years. But the main one was in 2016 when we vacationed out west um, and went to the Black Hills of South Dakota. Um, it's a long story, but I'll try to make it short. We were trying to... Um, find a lodge that was in the middle of the Black Hills and a bunch of the canyons and uh, kind of got lost. We were on this road for a while, came across a stream that had um, somebody there. Uh, uh, there were many people fishing, but um, at one point in the in the bend of the road, there was two people fishing right by the road. So we pulled off our car and got to talking with this guy and found out he lived there for his entire life. He's been all over the Black Hills, um, goes off trail all the time. Not so much because he was like 75 years old now, but um, I was really excited about being out there. And before we went, I looked on the BFR, web, our, BFR website, um, looked up South Dakota reports, and there's definitely some activity out that way. So after we asked for directions, I said, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to, you know, I hadn't really talked to many people outside of my family about Bigfoot at that time. So I just asked him, like, have you ever experienced anything weird in the forest, you know, over your many years of being out here? And um, he just straight up said, yeah, I, I have. And um, I'd actually ask, have you seen anything weird like a Bigfoot in this area, you know, throughout your many years of being here? And he said, actually, I have. And I've tried to tell many people about it, including my son, who was walking up at the time. That was the second person there. Um, and then he, his son heard him and they said, oh, is my dad boring you guys with his uh, BS Bigfoot stories again? And then he just walked off. And, and then his dad just looked at us and said, see, nobody believes me. But he said, he said, multiple experiences, and you know, in the back country of the Black Hills. So long story short, he had given us, that was our first night ever of going out doing kind of what finding Bigfoot does, like going out and doing a how he pointed us to a general direction. Like in the past 40 years, this is where I probably had like two or three experiences. So we went there in the dead of night and, um, did some off trail hiking and, um, South Dakota is known as a state that doesn't have any steady population of moose or bears. They're starting to have, you know, a couple more sightings of bears recently, but, um, we had ultimately we, um, went to an area, did several howls. This area was really in the middle of nowhere, really no houses around at all. Got three return howls and something came mm -hmm. up to us and was following us the whole trail in and out uh, the majority of it. And it was making really loud breaths at us. It was the, uh, the loudest it went. I mean, I wish I could do it, but it was like, <sighs> like that. And it was so freaky. And um, we heard like a blood murderous scream that was coming from one side of the hill. So there was at least two or three of them. And um, at one point we were walking back quickly to the car because we were really, really freaked out. And my brother looked back and saw this big shadow cross the path. And part of the path was gravel. So you could hear it going across the path and it went on the other side. And that's when we're like, we're done. We, we turned on a flashlight and didn't see a thing because there was pretty big trees. Anything could have been behind hiding behind a tree. Um, but we went in the car and then, yeah, we heard that blood murder scream that lasted. I, that's the most terrifying scream I've ever heard in my life. In my life, it lasted probably what seemed like 20 seconds, but really probably 15 seconds. And I had a recorder going at the time, but it was my first time ever recording. And the batteries run, were running low, so I only caught part of it. But that was our first time. There's a lot more to that story. That was the first experience we had, and it's been the best one ever since. And um, that's what convinced us that, yeah. We wow, were, so you feel they yeah. probably chased, chased you out of the out of the woods. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. Mate, that sigh that you're talking about that was probably almost like a, just get out of here. Kind of, you know, like how, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes you just get frustrated and you're just like, ah, I probably yeah. do that like 15 times a day. Yeah. <laughs> it's it so like, what's wrong? Wow. Yeah. The only big animal, mm -hmm. the biggest animal in South Dakota is, um, you know, they have very steady population of elk, but mm -hmm. I mean, it, I don't think it was an elk. I don't think it was anything other than, a sasquatch and i mean nothing why would an nature. elk be following you right yeah. right exactly yeah and this one on for a span like of a... probably 30 35 minutes yeah and if it was a predatory situation like if it was like a cougar or something else like that you would have known pretty quickly probably it was mm -hmm. do you know what i mean so exactly. it, was, it sounded like something following you and cats are more stealthy i think they, right. they're not gonna you're not yeah, gonna they're know ambush they're following predators you. so yeah. you're not gonna know they're there until they're on top of you right yeah, mm -hmm. we felt fairly confident that if, you know, a cat was stupid enough to try to, you know, pick on one of us that we would all jump in. And <laughs> yeah. Could you could you hear it walking, though? Or not oh, yeah. brush aside? So you could tell bipedal, you think? It's yeah, definitely sounded bipedal. It was keeping its distance away, but the branches it was breaking at some points would be so loud that 
we knew that shining a white flashlight, you know, they say in the Finding Bigfoot, like, oh, if you really want a Bigfoot to go away, shine a white flashlight or, but we wanted to, you know, have the experience originally, but then we started to get freaked out. So we started to shine on the flashlights and we did not hear anything, but, you know, 10 to 15 seconds after we would turn it off, you hear like crack, crack, and it would just keep going. Up. Was, so you, know, you guys awesome. were on a trail though, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever it was, was not on the trail. Correct. Correct. So it, obviously you got to rule out human because they mm -hmm. would need a light. To, they couldn't walk through off trail yeah. in the yeah. dark. Right. It was pitch, pitch black other than the, the moonlight coming down to light up the trail that we were on. Yeah. Right. Wow. And it was That's in the middle of That's a crazy story. Mm-hmm. I can tell you guys That's a lot more about it. It's probably like an hour long story, but we'll do that sometime. <laughs> we, we'll we'll say that for uh, when we see you in for May. Part two, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Penny Brown, part two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want to you want to get into some of the audio? Yeah, here? let's listen to it. So, so well, so kind of give a snapshot. We're going to go through some of the audio clips, and all are all of these clips ones that you've recorded. Yep, yep. All of the clips I sent you. Um, have been ones that my family and I have recorded over the past, like I said, almost four years of recording. And I tried to make them in chronological order of how they happened, like in 2019, 2020, 2021. As time goes on, you get a lot of data and you get a, one of our goals without a recording is if we can find patterns and data, why not share it with other researchers or, you know, around the country or people interested in the subject to try to push the subject further and actually get more evidence. And that's what's really cool about what you guys heard, because that's what you're doing. You're taking these audio and you're sending them off to, you know, Monagahela and David Ellis and, mm -hmm. and, and, and just to, to get their input on it as well. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right, let's see if I can. I'm going to add one of these, these audio clips. So for the audience that can't see this, uh, we're going to share an audio from uh, – uh, 2019, 323, 2019. It's called Two Howls. So, do you want to set this up, Kenny? Uh, yes. So, actually, that's a good point. Um, this one was captured March 23rd of 19. That one we started recording probably somewhere between March 7th and March, March 10th. So, in two areas that we were monitoring, because we hung up three total, we were getting most sounds in one area, but then we got these two howls in another area. Um, and the temperature was pretty pretty cold at that time, not terribly cold. Um, and there's this one location that has, over the past almost four years, has paid off on numerous occasions. And this is that specific location. So in this uh, specific clip, you'll hear two nice howls um, that really don't match a coyote pitch. Um, they really have certain characteristics in it. And um, one thing to look for when you go through audio is if you get a howl or something interesting that could potentially be, you know, um, something unknown making the sound like a Bigfoot, you look for secondary signals in the background. Like, is there, are there faint whoops? Is there faint wood knocks or any other potential indicator that there could be another Sasquatch in the area? Cause when you get that, it's a, a lot more likely that it could be, uh, be coming from a Sasquatch. Excellent. So let's play this and I'm getting better at this whole thing. <laughs> One thing to note. Shopify presents cool sheets from aha to I suffered from <laughs> advertising. I can stop that. Sorry, guys. That's okay. <laughs> well, that was pretty cool, though. That was yeah. a cool audio. I would encourage uh, um, anybody who's ever listened to audio, always use headphones. You can pick up so much more. Yep. And you know um, what else? I always close my eyes, too. Just yeah. because I, I know it sounds so silly. It's like... I just think your senses are more in tune when you're blocking out other senses. So I agree. I always no, like listen exactly intently right. with my eyes closed. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who can't hear the sounds uh, quite good enough, just definitely turn up your volume. Yep. Early on, we were using older microphones that weren't the best. So as time progresses, the quality will get a lot better as you'll hear. Yep. Gotcha. So do you want to share uh, which one do you want me to go to next? Do you have a Let me pull it up the list? Um, I would do the one that's from July 28th of 2019. I, that's the one I'd sent in the email to you specifically. Okay. Because um, David Ellis helped me edit it more. Oh, I found it here. Okay, let me pull it into the... Um, 
I try to do this where the commercial doesn't play afterwards, but okay. <laughs> so he's doing the no you're doing the July twenty eighth, two thousand nineteen. Yes. Okay. Let me just pull it into the. Uh... So can you tell it? So so what's can you set this one up to? Yeah. So that summer, um, really a number of months in twenty nineteen, it was a terrible year for Katie Ids, and that's always a killer when you try to record audio. Um, we record audio from nine p.m. to six a.m. every single night, um, without a beat in our units can record now for two months at a time where you don't have to come back and check it for two months. So it's great. Um, rather than every two weeks, gosh. <laughs> um, but this year it was really bad for Katie did. They would go all entire night and just be all sitting around your recorder and you really couldn't get anything, but they would do that until about three or 4 AM and then they'd settle down and you could start to hear more. Um, luckily with this recording, which in my opinion is one of the best, if not the best that we've gotten, um, the Katie did were just slowing down at night. So the, the one I have, on SoundCloud, it has the Katie Dids in the background, but I was able to send it to David Ellis after I already edited it, and he was able to remove a lot of the Katie Did noise. So you can really pick out the nice hows um, in this. As time has went on, we've captured a vocalizer over the past four years, very often doing five hows. Um, in all of those five hows that it, it's done, which we've probably captured, you know, two to three times, maybe four times over the past four years. Um, there's usually always secondaries in the background, like you'll hear knocks in the background or soft other other soft vocals. And this was one of them. And this is personally my favorite one. So um, yeah, this was at four something in the morning. I'd have to look at my notes. Um, and they were at this specific spot, which is the same as the two hows for, I think it was seven days. Seven days we got. Them. Cool. All right. Cool. Let's, go. let's, let's listen. Go ahead. Okay. Wow. So, so the, so the K-Dids, is that what you were saying? Yep. They're an insect called Katie Dids. Um, Katie Dids. Was there perhaps a, a different um, clip that I attached to that email? Cause it takes out those Katie Dids. It's totally okay, fine. Uh, I could uh, hear so. the, the howling in the background for sure. Right. But the, so what kind of insect is that? Because I've, we have those, those here too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's an insect that's green. It's, anywhere from less than an inch to probably two and a half inches long. Um, they can fly and they're very active at night. Some years you don't have many of them in the forest. And okay. I feel like recently the majority of the years, especially in the summertime and at night, um, they, they vocalize the majority of the night. So, And I also thought I heard like a boop, 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 boop. Yep, that yeah. is, this recorder is by a, um, a water source. So there's multiple bullfrogs in the background. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here. I couldn't pick it almost like a dog, but I wasn't mm -hmm. really sure. Yeah. And unfortunately the, the, the audio clip you sent me, I couldn't, I'm not technical enough to figure out how That's to okay. add that to the stream yard. So mm -hmm. I, can, I figured out how to do, um, I should have, I should have had Alex Highcheck help me uh, to do it. Oh, That's okay. But you could definitely can... hear the howling in the mm -hmm. background for sure. Yeah, I can, I should have uploaded the new one uh, to SoundCloud. I've always tried to keep it in a chronological order, but it's not going to happen. I, I've just posted, and then other people, if they want to listen, can listen to it on there without the Katie Dids. You can hear it much better. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely compelling. That's wild. Yeah, yeah it's super mm -hmm. cool. So I wanted to ask you this question, Kenny. Sure. So you know, it's almost like a question that I think I've I've asked Dr. Jeff Meldrum before, not here on the podcast, but just when you know I've been in his company. You know, like here you are, like you're going to be like a doctor and like you're super scientific. And I mean, do you share with uh, your colleagues uh, your interest in Bigfoot and what is their reaction? Sure. It's always a great question. It, it, mm -hmm. On my mind very often, um, unless I know somebody that's, you know, it, somebody that's in the woods a lot. Um, they're very experienced in the woods and um if I know them personally enough to a level where I can talk with them about it, I have, but on the majority of occasions, I usually don't bring it up. Just something I keep up by myself. I've always said, you know, 
I want to get through school first and um, get a job lined up first, you know, before I really do things like this. And I'm almost mm-hmm. done with school and I have a job lined up. So you guys are my podcast. <laughs> but at the same time, though, mm-hmm. it's just super cool to have someone like you who's so super smart, so educated, so um, in touch with yeah. science and um and the human body, um, Mm -hmm. which could be very close to what a Sasquatch is, Mm -hmm. um, be interested in the subject. So like in your opinion and like your doctor opinion, um, with your 99.9% assurance that this thing exists, Mm -hmm. what do you think they are? Yeah, I think that's, that's the million dollar question. Um, that'll get you the golden ticket. Um, Mm -hmm. I think they could, you know, be some relic hominoid that is a distant relation to us or maybe even closer than we think. Um, they could be very, very closely related to Gigantopithecus, um, you know, crossing the Bering Land Bridge. Um, they could have migrated from uh, Asia and, um, you know, they find a lot more fossils over there uh, than they do here for a multitude of reasons. But um, I think it could be you know, 50, 50 shot for one or the other. They could be very, very, very closely related to it, to us. Um, obviously they're very smart if they're bipedal. Um, Mm -hmm. there's a number of things to say about that, that you you can have a 30 minute podcast on, but, um, you know, and they could be more from the ape realm, you know, related to Gigantopithecus. I I think any option is open at this point, but I think as uh, anthropology in general moves forward and more evidence in this subject that we're discussing moves forward, I think we'll, you know, hopefully start to have a closer link or unless, you know, a body pops up somewhere and we're able to take DNA samples and really get the true, the true answers that we're looking for. Because we share a lot of DNA, even with a chimpanzee, which is not bipedal, which is not as intelligent as us. Well, maybe well, you some know of what I mean. <laughs> well, some, right. Yeah. But so do, do you think that a Sasquatch is m- more closely related to us than possibly a chimpanzee? Yeah. Yeah. I okay. think, I would say, again, for a multitude of reasons, but one that it's bipedal, uh, you know, there's reports of them going on all fours for a multitude mm-hmm. of reasons. But um, I think that they are more re- closely related to us than, um, you know, several other of the apes or orangutan, like you mentioned. Um, I think they're closely related to more closer related to us than they are. Um, so and what- they're super smart just based on the reports. And one big aspect that I like is just from people very experienced in the woods, you know, people that manage um, wildlife areas that go in the back country and who actually have these experiences and see something, you know, with a trained eye. I think those reports are always convincing, um, no matter what, what um, things you had, um, had happened to you in the woods, you know, that could be Sasquatch related. It's always interesting to hear other stories from, you know, professionals and those who have a trained eye. So what does, what is the connection between bipedalism and being super intelligent? What is that connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I guess even with a medicine background, I'm not the most experienced to answer that, but um, I've done some reading on it. And I think that I've read and heard that um, there's more brain development and, um, you know, things that walk bipedally. So hence humans and potentially Sasquatches, um, Mm -hmm. if they are indeed real. Um, Mm -hmm. And often with, um, you know, vaguely with certain um, increased brain development, there's a whole component of um, being very smart in the woods um, for any animal that may walk bipedally and staying very smart with staying stealthy um, and elusive. Mm -hmm. And being just upright in general. Upright in general. Being on fours, you're a little, you have a little bit more, you know, like you can just be more aware of your surroundings Mm -hmm. being upright. And do you very feel, their senses, yeah. mm-hmm. do you feel they they they're probably travel in you know tribes or family groups? Would that make sense? Yeah, yep. I if I had to guess, that's I would say that's probably what they do more often than not. You know, you might have males that branch off to try to find females for the whole reproductive aspect. Um, but I think mainly, and with the audio that we've obtained over the years, um, multiple multiple occasions we've had you know more than one Sasquatch related vocalization that occur at the same time from we use two microphones so you can hear stuff on this side and you can hear stuff on this side from multiple locations so something's happening over here and something's happening over here and we're recording it so that lends 
you know, to the data set that um, they likely do, uh, you know, stay closely to together, which probably makes finding food easier, finding, you know, different resources a lot easier if you work together. Do you, so do you think with some of the audio that you've collected um, that they're communicating together when you, you say you hear, you hear, you know, coming from different, you know, different locations, the sounds? Yeah. Yep. I'm a 100% believer in that. It's just um, what are they communicating about and how are they doing it and why are they doing it? Which I think it's so important to, you know, get all that data in, in their natural state. So kind of like wrapping things up a little bit, you know, we just had, we just hit the new year, 2023. So what are some of your research goals for this year? Yeah. So I would say research goals. Um, one thing we've talked about recently is, you know, we have enough data to where we're starting to see patterns of, in the in the area that we monitor, um, you know, these unknown sounds happen most often with this degree weather or this certain type of weather or with this moon phase um, and certain other things that we've uh, been able to come up with patterns regarding, um, you know, we've had this many vocalizations happen. So that's why we think they stay together in family groups. I think if we should, I've been thinking about potentially writing a book or coming up with some data set where I can publish to help other researchers use the data that we've collected in their research areas to try to, you know, Again, like I talked about earlier, push the subject further and open more eyes. Um, I think anything can help at this point, just as long as that's scientific. Well, I think you bring up a great point. And I just, I know I wasn't going to ask you this, but so there's a lot of data that sometimes we forget to collect. So you were mentioning moon phases and just different things. Can you, I know it's hard to say briefly, but mm -hmm. you know, what should, if, if I'm out in the woods trying to collect evidence, um, I mean, what type of data should I, what should I be writing down? Sure. So I would um, always go with things like, even if you don't have something um, happen in the woods, just spend time in the woods, um, learn about your local wildlife. And if you do hear something that's abnormal, something you've never happened, uh, heard before, you've had something happen to you that has never happened before, write it down, write down the time, write down, you know, the specific time and the time of year. Um, write down the weather conditions and keep a running log of that because you, as time goes on, you reflect back on those moments and try to identify patterns that can potentially lead you to have a, have an encounter or um, have something happen in, in the woods that's um, never happened to you before. Um, specifically, I'm just looking at some of the data here that we have. I still have, I've been behind. I have a lot more data to put into this, so results may change, but most of our recordings have, um, which I think is kind of an obvious one, happened when there's been no wind at all. Um, we've had multiple recordings happen throughout the entire night. So time-wise, there's really no specific one, but the, the most common time for a vocalization that's unknown to occur is around 10 p.m. Um, Temperature-wise, there's a, a kind of a bimodal distribution of um, when vocalizations most often occur. Um, we have the most between 36 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And then, so that's 11, we have 10 um, that ha have happened between 71 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And the others are single numbers by far. So, so a lot more data to put into is, um, it may change. Um, moon phase wise, the most common we have is a waning crescent. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could have something happen in your area on the night where there's a waning crescent. Um, mm -hmm. Things like that, you know. It's, that's awesome you know, though to collect that. That so. is cool. So, hey, Kenny, so how mm -hmm. can people keep up with you and all of this data? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I try to, I think my SoundCloud page is a great way to, you know, hear some of the sounds that we've recorded over the years. Um, and, and so what time. is that? Like, how do people get there? Can I share that yeah. link, I guess? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Yep. There's okay, a website cool. called SoundCloud. It's a free streaming platform. Um, advertisements may happen, but since I've started to record, you know, with my family and I, any sound that's interesting, there's a lot we don't have uploaded on there, but we upload the interesting ones onto SoundCloud so that people can, you know, take a listen for themselves and you know, decide uh, what they heard. If anybody knows any of the sounds that I've heard or if they have a good example, you know, please email me, um, Kenny underscore Brown 33 at yahoo.com. Uh, email me, email me any audio clips. Um, you know, I have much more, there's much more, much more experienced people than I that go through all of this audio um, on a regular basis. David Ellis, like we mentioned, Monongahela, um, Charles Kimbrough, Charlie Page, some of my good friends, Dusty Ruth, uh, Mark DeWorth. Yeah, many people, you know, trying to trying to capture audio. So 
You forgot um, the other guy, Dr. Russ Jones. Dr. Russ Jones, yeah. He's more of the camera guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a camera guy. Yeah. He's got like yeah. 500 trail cams out there. but <laughs> At least. So no, that's cool. I love, I love that. I love that you guys are uh, the family that does it. I love that you're, sh you're, you're sharing the data for the bigger calls. And I just, we've always loved you guys just from the first day we met you. So I'm, yeah. I'm so happy that we got you on here. So. We look, yeah, we look like forward Lance. to seeing you in mm -hmm. May in Ohio. Yes. Yep. It's, it's been great to actually like take some time and I sit know. and talk to you. I know. You know, because you just get so overwhelmed by the whole Brown the family. Yeah. There's like just so <laughs> many of you, you know, but to just like sit and talk individually with one of you for an hour is super cool. So we really appreciate you being on our podcast. Yeah, this is oh. awesome. It has been great. Sure. No, I greatly appreciate it. You guys have a fantastic podcast. Um, several months away, we'll be talking in person and um, I think yep. we're all looking forward to it. Can't wait, yeah, Kenny. Thanks awesome. so Thanks, much. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks for joining Thank you. us. Yeah, right. likewise. Thank you. All right. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Kenny, see Yeah, cool. that's so fun. I think I, we need to have each of the brown individuals on the show. I think. Because so, and I forgot. Maybe to tell we Kenny. could do Mike and Teresa at the same time. Yeah, maybe. And we have like a little double date. So, podcast funny, with funny story in the book, mm -hmm. in the back of my book, I, I list. And I missed a bunch of people, so I apologize to some of the individuals I didn't get. But I try to list some of the other individuals that are out there, whether they're researching or influencing the subject. Mm -hmm. I just put the Brown family. I didn't. <laughs> I, they probably got a kick out of it because uh, I just said, you know what, they're family. I just wrote they're so cool. the Brown family. As, but Kenny's I, super cool, and I'm glad are. we like took the time to really yeah, get to know him because it's hard. We're gonna, we're gonna need to have each one on individually for sure. But I'm super excited about what Kenny's doing with the audio. And we're, we are looking forward to seeing him soon. Um, and we are the Bigfoot Influencers. Actually, we're not the Bigfoot Influencers. We're the Bigfoot Influencers podcast. And we interview the influencers in the, do in the world of Bigfoot. And Tim wrote a book, obviously called The Bigfoot Influencers, where he has interviewed a lot of the top researchers in the world of Bigfoot. Obviously, not all of them. And there's probably going to be a volume two so he can make sure that he can uh you know get to know what everybody else is doing um how can you buy the book you can buy the book um at some museums mm -hmm. um the north american bigfoot center mm -hmm. in oregon at the cryptozoology museum in maine um sasquatchthelegend.com yep you can also find it on amazon mm -hmm. um as well anywhere barnes and noble barnes amazon, and noble and Target. it's just a great book yeah. it's a reference to who's who in the world of Bigfoot and what they're doing. So it's almost like a reference of all of the researchers. Um, so we, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, just type in the Bigfoot influencers and you'll be able to see what's going on and what we're doing. Yeah, this is yeah, great. And thank it you guys. Been great. It's been, I'm looking forward to an awesome 2023. We're going to have a few real, some really cool podcasts coming up. Actually, we're going to have a, a witness podcast coming up as well. Woo. And then, and then going back to the Esteban Sarmiento one, we're going to have a couple live people come in and do ask Esteban some questions. We're going to open up the chat. We're going to get some questions ahead of time. It's going to be fun. It's yep. going to be able to put him on the spot in a good way. He'll he he'll love it. And then you Absolutely. guys can ask him a, a you know all kinds of questions. So yeah, because Doctor Esteban is a primatologist. So. And he's, you know, studies great apes and mm -hmm. spent 20 years or so in Africa doing it. So he's definitely has is one that uh, could be interesting. We should get Gabriel on our son, Gabriel, yeah. our youngest. He would. He won't do it. I think he would just to ask him a question. Oh, maybe we can do I that. I think we should do it. Okay. But well, have, I think and we have I think I have a surprise uh, guest lined up to come in and help us ask a couple questions, too. Yeah. So. But that's it, guys. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next episode. And um, we appreciate your viewership. Do. And don't forget to like and subscribe yeah, on Untold that. Radio. Um, and we appreciate you. Thank yep. you. Thank you, guys.